Come on, give a hand clap for Jesus. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. I didn't say give a hand clap to me. Give a hand clap to Jesus. Yes, Lord. 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 seats from every seats 20 years old man and you know it's, it's crazy because I for some of you who do not know um, I play football you know and I play football at UConn and I'm not home often and you know the times that I do get to come home you know it's, it's every time is different man it's just different I mean Every time I come home, Janae's just like five inches taller. She's almost taller than me. Aiden's taller. Joshua's taller. Everybody's growing up on me, man. And it's like, man, it, it is crazy. You guys hear me all right there? Yeah. All right, all right. It's crazy, but it is truly a blessing to, to be here. It's truly a blessing to be able to have the opportunity to speak and, and to preach you all. Um, I want to honor and thank my mother and father. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I, mean, I tell them every time, you know, the reason why I'm in the position I am is because for 20 years they have discipled me, they have taught me, they have blessed me, um, and I'm just forever grateful for you too, for all you guys have done for me, and uh, grateful for my family, my three sisters who always have my back, always support me. And, and that's you all. And grateful for you all, you know, everyone here. You know, I know you guys have been supporting me while I've been gone and reaching out, and it really means a lot. So I want to thank you guys. And, you know, as I sit here and as I reminisce on, you know, all that has happened and as I think back at the times that I was a little boy running around in the church and I think back at all the times that, you know, I've been uh, just doing other things, you know, and one thing that I realize is that time is passing me by quickly. Well, really, really quickly. I'm using mic. Testing, testing, one, two. I realize that time is passing me by very, very quickly. And I know most of us don't want to think about it, but time is passing all of us by, right? Day by day, we see our kid. It's about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may be. see all the things that are going on and see you see how with all the politics and all the mess and all the chaos that's going on and you, you you we have to understand that time is passing us by every day people are dying every day there is a good and there is a calling and there is a mission that we all have to do and we are not doing it before I begin let us pray 
Father, I want to thank you for using me as your vessel, Father. I pray that you open up all of our hearts and minds and ears, Father God, so I could speak your word to your people, Father. We thank you for this opportunity for bringing us all here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'll be reading mainly from the book of Jude, but I'll be pulling, pulling uh, multiple passages from multiple different areas. Starting off with Jude. Verses 1 through 4, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to those who may have been called, who are loved, and God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. That's all of us sitting here in this room. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and to urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whom condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. The title of my message today is Time is Ticking, Contend for the Faith. Jude. First one to write about the salvation that we all share, right? This is the salvation that Jesus died for on a cross. The salvation that is free to everyone and anyone. The salvation that rescues us from a place of danger and deliver us, delivers us into a place of safety. So the salvation which is in the reality of the past, present, and the future. This salvation is shared by many and is available to those who choose to believe in Jesus Christ. This is originally what Jude wanted to write about. But I can imagine as Jude was sitting down and getting ready to write this letter that he felt compelled to write something different. See, Jude was observing the world and observing the church, and when he did, he found a problem. Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. We, have a problem. we have a problem. The problem <laughs> was that the salvation that we were just describing was being threatened by the young God. And Jude knew what was going on, and he couldn't hold his tongue. See, Jude had to warn God's beloved people, not only because those people were unaware of the situation, but also because he knew what would happen if he did. This is interesting because Paul writes the same kind of warning at the beginning of his letter to the church in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, it says, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again, we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcome, let that person be cursed. See, both Paul and Jude, in their own context, realized that the good news was being threatened. And they urgently had to encourage and warn God's people to contend for that which saved them. How many times, how many people in this room have had a moment where they needed to discern between what they really wanted to say and what they really needed to say to someone? And that depending on the situation and the context of the situation, it led us into making that decision. Just like Jude did as a body of Christ, I believe we are all compelled to contend for the faith. To contend for the faith in our home. To contend for the faith in our church, in our neighborhood, in our city, in our country, and in our world. But notice that Jude doesn't first address contending for the faith. He first addresses the issues within the church. Look at what he says in verse 4. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ as our only sovereign and Lord. To be ungodly simply means to be irreligious or immoral. See, these are people who are selfish, lustful, sinful. They bear no fruit. These are people who walk in the flesh. See, these are the type of people that Jude is talking about here with those who claim to love God, but they don't really love God. See, these are people who claim that they can do whatever they want, live however they want, 
say whatever they want just because God will just forgive them anyway. See, these are, the, so, so, these are people who like the idea of God but don't like following God. See, these are the type of people who were once Christians, but because of life and or trials and tribulations, they have fallen from the faith. They have come up with the conclusion that their way is better than God's way. And anyone who tries to tell them otherwise and correct them is wrong and judgmental. And especially with those particular people. See, they're not mad at you. So they get so angry, but the crazy thing is they're not mad at you. They're mad at what you're reminding them of, which is the truth. But, but despite what others may be doing, we all need to take a step back, right? Because the one thing that we all have to do is look in the mirror first. Because if we're really being honest with ourselves, what Christians don't want to admit but have to realize is that we are not that far from falling to. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into temptation and condemnation. See, those who fall from the faith after being in the faith fall simply because they're too overconfident that they won't. It may take one bad day at work. It may take one argument. It may take someone calling you off at traffic. It may take a movie or a show. For some of us, it may take a song. Or it may take one look at a man or woman in a grocery store or in a gym. None of us are too far. You're not in danger when you start sinning. We're in danger when you start believing that you can. See, the reason any Christian is still a Christian is because God is keeping them. And the only reason that you're still standing is because God has given you the means to. See, Jude is talking about those people who are in the church who are currently falling into the hands of the enemy. See, everything you see in this world, all the sin, corruption, injustice, it's all rooted in two things, unbelief and lack of trust. Some of you in this room, or even some of you watching online, may be on the verge of falling simply because of your unbelief and your lack of trust. See, isn't this what we first see in Adam and Eve? That when a serpent came to tempt them, that he caused them to question their belief and trust in God. Yeah. See, he convinced them that God was keeping something from them. And he was only just trying to protect them. See, Adam and Eve then decided they wanted to defy God's commands and do what they wanted. They didn't believe that God was good enough and they didn't trust that he has given them everything that they need. This is also the same reason that Satan came. We have to be careful because we can fall into this trap too. We often ask God questions. God, why can I have sex before marriage? Why is sex just for married people? God, why can I get a better job? Why won't they like me? Why can I make more money, God? God, why won't you give me a spouse? God, how could you let this happen to me? It all comes down to this. Is God really good? And can I really trust him? What Christians have to understand is the opposite of worshiping God is not worshiping Satan, but worshiping self. And sometimes we think wrath is just hell and destruction. But wrath is really God letting people do whatever they want. See, what is happening in our churches in this world is that people are putting their faith into themselves and into things that are not faithful. See, God has given us pleasures and joys, but because sin dominates our lives, even God-given joys and pleasures seem empty. And the reality of it is that those unfaithful things that we depend on so much always come up short because they were never meant to fill the God-shaped hole in our hearts. This is the issue that Jude is addressing to God's called chosen people, to me and you, to Christians. God's grace is not a license for us to sin. Grace is not a permission slip for you to get by. It's God giving you the space to get right. Jesus tells us in John chapter 8, verse 11, go and sin no more. Sinful desires shape how we live, what we believe, and what controls us. This is the important message that we are called to share, the message of the gospel, the true gospel. We have a mission to contend for the faith. Matthew chapter 29, verses 19 through 20. 
It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am always with you, even to the end of the age. As Christians, it is our God-given mission, our calling to contend for the faith and spread the gospel. We are missing out on what life was intended for. We are not contending for the faith. This is the most important thing that we do in our life. And are we even doing our job? Are you doing your job? How can we say that we believe that there is a heaven and a hell and that every soul is going to be in one of those places and the difference is what someone believes in Jesus and we have the truth and we don't share it? See, you cannot share the gospel and not use words. The gospel is words. The gospel is good news. When do we start believing that the good news was bad news? The problem that we all face is that we either don't know that this is our calling, we don't know how to contend for the faith, or we're simply doing it wrong. Whether you believe it or not, people are going to hell every single day. Those we see on the route, on the road, driving back from work, our classmates, our teachers, our coworkers, our family, and our friends, simply because they don't know Jesus. We have to lead people to Jesus. We have to contend for the faith. To contend means to fight, to struggle, to worship, to wrestle. The word was mostly used in Greek when two men were engaging in a physical athletic competition like wrestling. Two men would fight, struggle, resist, grab, brace, and attack each other until one victor came on the top. Before I became a football player, the first sport I participated in was wrestling. See, I was a little boy and I didn't know much about the sport and all I wanted to do is what I saw people on TV do, and that should just pick people up and slam them. <laughs> I didn't have much technique at first, but the other boys I was fighting were simply not strong enough for me, so I overpowered them every time. But once I started to win, I went up against tougher opponents. And I realized that some of my opponents had the same physical skill set as me. On top of that, they were more technically sound than me because they knew more than me. They knew more grappling moves and takedowns that I didn't know. And I was struggling to compete with them because they were better than me. And I realized that in the real world of wrestling, I'm going to have to equip myself with techniques and principles that I can follow. So no matter the situation that I was put into, when I went into battle, I was prepared for it. I believe that it is our God-given calling to wrestle, to fight, and to struggle for the faith. And Jude, along with other scriptures, gives us techniques and principles how we should do that. Going back to Jude, says, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love, and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that can contaminate their lives. Jude does not just give one method of how to evangelize. He gives us various methods depending on your knowledge of the person and the wisdom and application of what you need. I have four points to you today for how to contend for the faith. Point number one, know who you are following. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it states, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. We are currently in the middle of an ongoing war. We're in the middle of a war of who will we serve, the God of this world or the one and only true king? Which way will we go? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, which way will you go? The thing about it is that Satan doesn't even need you to worship him. He just wants you to worship anything and anyone else but God. See, Satan, he wants to separate you as far away from God as possible. And we are at war. But the amazing thing about it is that we know how this war ends and who is victorious. But the sad thing about it is that there's many people out those doors who don't. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 states, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Mm -hmm. We are not at war with people. 
we are at war with the ideas that blind those from the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And the problem that we have is that we are not unaware, not only unaware of the war, but we are also unaware of how to fight in this warfare. We are not contending and fighting for the faith in this world like we should be. Too many Christians are trying to make the blind see without introducing them to the light. This brings me to my next point. Point number two, how to contend for the faith. Build yourself in the truth of God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The same Bible that condemns you packs in a promise that can save you. I believe one of our biggest obstacles to sharing the message of Jesus Christ is that we live a hypocritical life, which means that if we tell someone that we have to follow Jesus, then we actually might have to start following Jesus, <laughs> which some of us don't want to do. See, you can't be like the world that convinced the world to follow God. And we have to ask... We have to ask ourselves, why would someone believe in the gospel if it hasn't changed you? Why would I believe in someone who you don't even know? See, we contend for the faith by knowing the truth and by letting the truth change our lives. And we do that by studying the Bible. You cannot teach what you do not know. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Study this book of instruction continually, meditating on it day and night so that you will obey everything written in it. Only then. Only then, yeah. only then yeah. will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Yeah. We need to arm ourselves in the five basic doctrines of Christian faith. Number one is God. Who is God? What's his characteristics? Who is his character? Number two is creation. How did everything come to be? Number three is sin. What is the consequence of sin? And what does sin do to us? Number four is redemption. What are we saved from? And who has saved us? Number five is restoration. What is promised for us in the future? We need to meditate on the word day and night. Only then will we be successful in contending for the faith. Without studying and understanding of these things, we cannot know how to contend for the faith correctly. The only guarantee of success is when we seek God's way through his word. Point number three for how to contend for the faith. Pray and pray with power. See, prayer is the most underused tool in the arsenal of both kingdom men and women. See, when we pray in the Holy Spirit, what we are doing is we're allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us in the direction that God has for us. The Holy Spirit leads us in how we live, how we speak, and how we address God. In Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 27 it says, and the Holy Spirit helps you, us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with the groanings and cannot be expressed in words. And the Father knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Prayer isn't about sending up some words to God. It involves knowing God, listening to him, aligning your heart with his. We need to pray and pray with intention. Yeah. Prayer is not just something that we just cross off of our list. Yeah. We need to pray for change, for mercy, for love, for direction, for wisdom, for protection, for each other, and for others. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, will you pray for me? Pray for me. On the final, fourth and last point for how to contend for the faith, is to show mercy with fear and fruit. The fear that God is talking about here is God's judgment. The fear that Jude, excuse me, is talking about here is God's judgment. There are two types of fear. Fear of respect and honor for the believer. And for the unbeliever, the fear of the judgment of God and eternal death, which is ultimately eternal separation from God. See, fearing God simply means to take God seriously. To take him seriously by letting your actions reflect your honor and respect for him. Verse 23 of Jude, it tells us to rescue, save, and snatch those from the flames of judgment. Bringing people to Jesus saves them from God's judgment. And we can only do this by the fruits of the Spirit, with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Being impatient, rude, 
intense, judgmental, and arrogant are not ways of the spirit. These, along with others, are awful ways to contend for the faith. In Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 through 6, it says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It is impossible to love Jesus and treat people like trash. Let me say that again. It is impossible to love Jesus and treat people like trash. If we saw more Christians contending for the faith with the fruits of the spirit, we would see more Christians. We are to hate the sin that contaminates the lives, but love the sinner. Those who are unbelievers are lost and in need of salvation, like we all once were. We must remember not to fall in the trap of compromise. Don't water down the truth to keep your relationship alive. See, a watered-down gospel is no gospel at all. The call to repentance is not easy. You have to care more about the other person's soul than your relationship with them. You can't be more worried about your relationship with you instead of their relationship with the Father. We must stand firm and make sure our footing is safe and secure on the truth. As I close... To contend for the faith, you have to first know who you are fighting. Then build yourself up in God's word. Pray and pray with power. And show mercy with fear and truth. This is calling for all God's kept, beloved, and chosen people. For everyone sitting in this room, we have to do this. We must do this. For some, this is not an easy task. It may be difficult at first, uncomfortable. But remember that you are not called to change everything or everyone. We are only called to be obedient, and God will handle it from there. Amen. Obedience is not determined by the outcome. Stand to your feet. I'm a big movie guy, big movie story guy. You know, and I love watching all types of actions and thrillers and Marvel. Marvel is my most favorite brand of movie I like to watch. And there's always three parts to any story, any movie that you read or you watch. There's always the beginning, the middle, and the end. The beginning always tells us the context and the background of the movie and how everything comes together. Then usually in the middle of the action and conflict come in. And sometimes when I watch movies, I get discouraged because it always seems like the bad guy is winning. But for some reason, through my discomfort in the situation that I currently see in the movie, I always stay till the end. And that's because every good story has a great ending. And despite what the beginning was and how everything came to be and what happened in the middle of the movie with all the chaos and the troubles, I know that the ending is always going to work out for the good. I can imagine for some of you, this message may have been hard to hear. You may have been convicted, challenged, may have felt overwhelming, may be tough. But the great thing I love about Jude's letter is at the end. Because Jude gives us a great ending. Verse 24 to 25 says, Now, all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away, and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single all glory to him who is alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. amen. That, that last part, amen. The end, amen, means it's a confirmation. It means it is so or to be firm or sure, or to agree. I want to encourage you all that you have confirmation that God is able to keep you from falling. Yes. That you can be sure that he will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault because of Christ Jesus. We can be firm in our faith knowing that God has equipped us with all the tools that we need to contend for the faith that he has given us a helper to do it the right way. The 
title that my message that my dad preached on Friday was my father knows what he is doing and then last Sunday he preached I am a willing participant we all need to be willing participants to contend for the faith and allowing God to use us where he sees fit and no matter what it looks like what it sounds like or what is going on with all the craziness and all the ungodliness in the world we have hope remain hopeful because we have confirmation that our Father knows what He's doing. Amen.